So in the last video, I talked about how the rapture is going to take place on the eighth day, and I sort of went into all the other events that are going to take place on that same day that we're caught up to God and to his throne as kings and priests. But I didn't really address some of the other things that are going to be happening to believers, to glorified saints who are in heaven at that time. And uh, I want to sort of compare and contrast with the general narrative that's out there about uh, what happens as soon as we get to heaven. But before I do that, I want to just mention something that during that seven days that there's this huge revival taking place after we've been identified uh, by an outpouring, I believe, or a, a a re-impartation, a larger impartation of the Holy Spirit when we're ministering to people during that seven days while Satan is here on the earth with his, um, you know, aliens, demons, light beings, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we'll know what it is when we get there. Uh, while we're ministering to people, though, some of the people we minister to are going to be people who were basically backslidden Christians. They're, they're believers, but they didn't... Um, they didn't live faithfully. So they're going to ch have a change of heart, and many of them, and come to, uh, you know, a larger faith in Christ that actually manifests itself in faithfulness and so on. And then there's going to be um, other people who come to Christ who never did, who were never believers to begin with, but they come come to know the Lord, as well as people who are among the 144,000 of Israel who will say yes to Jesus. There's two different trajectories that these people are on. So the 144,000 of Israel, they are going to actually have the opportunity to be firstborn, okay, to be kings and priests. And so one of the things I just want to distinguish here is uh, Revelation makes a distinction between uh, the three groups of raptured saints in terms of how they get there and why they're there. And then also um, the the people who are martyred, their position um, during the millennium. So I just want to look at that a little bit. And then um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what believers are going to do once we get to heaven. So something that I didn't really become aware of until I started really looking at the details in the book of Revelation. And I noticed that not every group that appears before God in heaven is dressed the same or is doing the same things. Um, some are standing, some are seated, um, and they're in different locations, and some have uh, different promises to them. And I would encourage you to read through the book of Revelation yourself and take a look at these groups of people, and you'll see that they're not the same and different. they're promised different things Okay, during the millennium. People who are faithful, um, and it doesn't, faithfulness again does not mean that you do a lot of things. It just means that you're running the race to the end. You're putting Jesus first in your life as best you know how. You're wanting to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's all, okay? That's all it means. And you submit to the work of the Spirit in your life. It doesn't mean you're you know, have a YouTube channel, you're a pastor, you're a missionary, you saved so many people, prayed the prayer with so many. It, that does not have anything to do with faithfulness. It's like faithfulness in a marriage. Everybody knows what it means to be faithful in a marriage. You know, that you stay true in your thoughts, words, and deeds. And that's basically it. And if you're interested in learning more about that, that's a whole another video series. Um, there's many of them that I've done. I'll link to some of those in the description box. But I want to talk about people who are going to be kings and priests because this is a I hate to call it a class but it's a, a group of people that is different their their millennial activities are going to be different than other people so um, we have those who are kings and priests and then there's going to be people who are just priests And then they're what I call the worshipers. Okay, and these are the three groups of people that I see. Oh, and there's one more, um, and that's just, I'm going to put other, because I don't really know exactly where they fit into the big scheme of the millennium and all of that. But the 24 elders we know are kings and priests. 
Okay, and we also know that those who are beheaded by the beast are going to be priests to God and they're going to rule and reign on the earth. And we know that the 144,000 who are faithful will have the crown of life. That means they're a king. They're going to receive this crown and they're going to also follow the lamb wherever he goes. That means if he's on the earth during the millennium, they'll go with him there. If he goes to heaven, they go with him there. So the 144,000. Okay, all kings and priests, according to the book of Revelation. There is a group that are just priests only. That is, they're just in the white robe, and they um, have the palm branches in their hands. And these, this is the group from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, that great multitude standing before the throne of God in Revelation 7. These are the people who've come out of the great tribulation for believers. I'm talking about that 10-day tribulation for believers. They, um, they are a special group um, and the Bible says that they don't leave God's presence. They don't leave the heavenly temple, which means they're not going to come to earth to rule. So they're going to spend the whole millennium in God's temple worshiping and ministering to him. That's the fifth seal martyr. So this is uh, something that we are going to be communicating to people during that seven-day period of time because there's going to be um, new believers and then there's going to be people who are backslidden who come to Christ and all kinds of people are going to be getting saved. It's going to be the biggest revival in human history. It's the big one. Okay, It's the one everybody's talking about, but really we have no concept of how many people are going to get saved. And what we need to tell these people is that they are going to be martyred and they need to be okay with that. Okay, If they will be willing to lay down their lives to wash their robes basically in the blood of the Lamb, in their own blood, that they will have a place in God's kingdom. And they will still go on to live um, in the New Jerusalem when uh, this age passes away, the millennial reign is over, and we have the new heavens and the new earth. They're not going to miss out on whatever other people get during the, um, uh, the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, And I have done videos on the new heavens and the new earth and so on and so forth. Okay, so in Revelation 15, this is where we see the overcomers. These are those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, until basically the day of the Lord begins, the wrath of God starts to be poured out. These are people, they just have harps in their hands. We don't see them wearing a white robe like these people do. Um, these people are wearing a white robe, the white priestly robe, plus they're sitting on thrones um, and they have crowns on their head. And I think part of the throne thing is that they are also going to judge because when Christ returns, we see thrones set up and then people to whom judgment is committed sitting on those thrones. So I think the judgment seat, okay, this is a throne of judgment as well as a throne to rule from. That's something that, again, will go to these people right here. These people who are worshipers, they just hold the harps of God, and they sing a song, and that's what they do. And these are um, the people who are taken in the third rapture. There's other people who are not going a part of these groups. Okay, There's people in the past who were born again, but they were not faithful in their walk with the Lord. Um, they are, um, they're they not going to be resurrected in this resurrection of kings and priests, but they will be resurrected at the end, um, at the seventh trumpet. And this is when uh, the time comes for the dead to be raised and for rewarding God's servants. Okay, so this is uh, all the rest of the of believers get uh, resurrected at the seventh trumpet. So I hope you can see that people who believe in kind of what I would call a pre-trib, the 144,000 are going sort of mid-trib, and then there's people who are going pre-wrath, and then there's people who are going to be resurrected post-trib. Uh, 
that all of these are are in this timeline. There's reasons why people believe all those things, but they haven't seen the whole picture that actually everything is in here. So there are going to be other Christians who are um, who've lived throughout history who will be resurrected when Christ returns at the seventh trumpet, the time for the dead to be raised and for rewarding his servants, the prophets. The seventh trumpet is the very last thing after Armageddon. It's the very last thing. Uh, the angel in Revelation 10 says that when the seventh trumpet sounds, that the mystery of God, as declared to his servants, the prophets, will be fulfilled. The mystery of God in this case, in the book of Revelation, is the whole body of Revelation. It's the That is the unveiling of this mystery, and that is what is going to be uh, fulfilled at the time of the seventh trumpet. So the seventh trumpet is like at the very end. It's not stuck somewhere in the middle, okay? And it doesn't happen immediately after the second woe. It's going to happen at the very end, according to Revelation chapter 10. Okay, so the rewards for believers happen at the seventh trumpet. That's when he says that it's time to reward his servants and the servants and the prophets. Okay, so the rewards happen at the seventh trumpet. So the rewards for believers are at the seventh trumpet. I don't see them happening before that. Um, these are classes uh, or groups of people with different jobs in during the millennium. And by the way, Solomon's temple is prophetic of the millennial reign of Christ. And you have Christ as king, and then there's priests, and there are worshipers in his temple, and there are other people who serve. So the the millennial reign of Christ has all these positions available, place for everybody during the millennium. Solomon's temple basically incorporated the Tabernacle of David worship system with the Mosaic system, and they sort of morphed together and then actually became a, a much different worship system than either the Tabernacle of David or the Tabernacle of Moses. So that's a whole other study. I've done um, a series on that called uh, The Temples of God. Extremely interesting uh, stuff if you're wanting to know how the Tabernacle of Moses, the Tabernacle of David, and the uh, Solomon's Temple are prophetic of different time periods or different dispensations in God's um progress of human history. When we talk to people during this period of time, during the seven days, a, a big emphasis is on joyful martyrdom because that's what's going to be the end result for most of these people. They are going to be martyred. Some of them will live on into the reign of the beast. And actually, if it was me and I had a choice between martyrdom or you know, living through the reign of the beast, I would choose martyrdom. As soon as they get in heaven, it's just a very short wait. They receive their immortal glorified bodies, their priestly robe. They get to stand in, in heaven and worship God. And this is, this is a much better thing for them than people who uh, survive the reign of the beast and are alive when Jesus returns. They, you know, they, they're worshipers, which is kind of another step down as far as um, honor goes. Now, during the reign of the beast, there are people who are going to be martyred at that time. These are people who are beheaded. If you're beheaded during the reign of the beast, okay, you will qualify as kings and priests. So the, you know, once the raptures have happened, the, the first two raptures of the 24 elders and the 144,000, um, you're better off just getting martyred okay you're it's it's a better deal for you as far as you know rewards for faithfulness and position in the kingdom okay and enduring during the reign of the beast that's that's not going to be such a fun thing okay something about the 144,000 that I just want to mention is and I'll I'll do a larger video series on this so you know you can kind of ask me some questions, but basically your questions will probably be answered in the videos that I do later on down the road about the 144,000 is that just because you're called doesn't mean you're uh, 
chosen and faithful. Okay, so when Jesus called his 12 disciples, he knew Judas was in the bunch. He knew that he would end up betraying him. Judas was called and he self-selected. Okay, that's what means to be chosen, that you decide that you are going to choose Jesus. He calls you and, and chooses you and then you choose him. But the bottom line here is if you're called and you're chosen, you have to remain faithful in order to receive the inheritance. So Judas, obviously, he was called, he was chosen, he was not faithful, he betrayed Christ, and he lost the inheritance. Peter was called, he was chosen, he denied Christ, and he had to be reinstated as part of that chosen group um, and be faithful in order for him to actually be remain a part of that particular foundational group that Christ, you know, himself personally discipled. During the last days, the 144,000 of Israel are sort of modeled after the 12 disciples. And just like the 12 disciples, they have to remain called, chosen, and faithful if they want to receive everything that's a part of their inheritance. Now, it's possible to be called and chosen and not be faithful. And again, this is uh, demonstrated throughout biblical history. God chose the nation of Israel. He called them out of Egypt. But when they were in the wilderness, they were faithless. They didn't have faith in God. They were not allowed into the promised land they didn't receive their inheritance because of that. Okay, so it's really important to remain faithful or you can lose what the, you know, the inheritance that God has for you. And the inheritance is a wonderful thing and God wants you to have it. So really there's no room for saying, oh, you know, I don't really care. I'm happy to be a street sweeper or whatever on the streets of gold. God has bigger plans for you and he wants you to step into them. It's not about you and what you want. It's what about God and what he wants for you. So you need to submit to that idea as well. Okay, so the 144,000 could lose their inheritance and that is what the letters to the seven churches are primarily addressing. They have a need to remain faithful. It's important for them to be faithful in their calling. And I'll talk more about that in another video. I've, I've talked about it in the past, but I have a lot of things I want to add to um, the things that I've already talked about in uh, lessons on that that I did uh, a couple years ago. So this is how people are sort of divided up in the book of Revelation. Okay, and all you have to do is read the book yourself and you'll see these distinctions. Uh, they're definitely there. I'm not Again, not making things up. So in the previous video, I talked about the traditional pre-tribulation understanding of the rapture and so on. And before I talk about what our activities in heaven are going to be, uh, I want to talk about what the common teaching is on immediately after the rapture, what is going to happen to us in heaven. So uh, we have uh, a rapture, which pre-trib for the most part just believes in one okay so you go up you go to heaven and they believe that all believers are taken and they believe that it's the bride of Christ that's taken okay so all believers compose the bride of Christ I've done a lot of videos on the bride that I think are fabulous <laughs> and uh that's because the Bible's fabulous and Jesus is fabulous. And we've been given a really fabulous prophetic book that tells us about the things that are going to happen just prior to Christ's return. So we want to match up the timelines and the theology uh, and our eschatology. We want to match it up to what we see in Revelation. To me, this is a really, really important thing. And I, I really can't understand how this is lost on so many people who teach Revelation. Okay, so this is, uh, again, this is a typical theory. All believers will go. There's only one rapture. This group that's caught up there, the, known as the Bride of Christ. So as soon as uh, we're in heaven, there is something called the Wedding Supper. 
they believe that it lasts for seven years. And then Jesus comes back at the end. Okay, so there's seven years of of wedding the wedding supper of the lamb and believers are in heaven as the bride of Christ and Christ is the groom and they follow the Galilean wedding tradition okay but here's we're we're getting into some sticky wickets here so if we have a 7 year wedding supper that correlates with 7 days or the the week that was traditionally um wedding festivities have this scenario where the rapture begins a seven year event. And then we also have the idea of the rapture is out here somewhere. We don't know where. And then there's a, uh, the Antichrist confirming a covenant and seven years and the second coming. So does the seven years begin at the rapture with this wedding supper scenario with this week of years of wedding? Or does it begin with the Antichrist confirming a covenant with the rapture out here somewhere uh, not connected to the seven years at all? So there's a little cognitive dissonance going on here as far as you can't have both of these. Either one is the way it is or the other. Now the other thing with the whole idea of a wedding supper um, being the first thing that happens and sometimes people will say it's the Bema seat um, where people get rewards. But again the uh, book of Revelation tells us that the rewards are at the end. They're when Christ returns at his second coming. So that that isn't what happens, but that's what people teach. You get the, the Bema seat first, and then there's this wedding supper of the Lamb while there's seven years of, you know, wrath happening down here. Okay, and if the wrath of God is here for seven years, and we know there's people getting saved during that time, they are going to have the Holy Spirit. That means that God is pouring out his wrath on people that are saved. Okay, so this, again, does not correlate with what the Bible says. Okay, God's wrath should not be being poured out on people who are, you know, giving their life for the Lord. Okay, so again, this is a problem with the pre-tribulation rapture position. And maybe I just need to do a whole video on the pre-trib rapture problems. Okay, so I've got, I've got three of them listed right here. There's another problem that we have if we use this wedding supper scenario is that the bridegroom doesn't work okay for the for the full week he is at rest and at leisure for a whole week and in fact for a whole year after that he doesn't go to war he is like at home with his wife we don't see that in the book of revelation we see jesus is actually very busy he's doing a lot of things at the very least he's opening up seals okay so he's hanging out with his bride and then, excuse me, honey, I need to go open the first first four seals and uh, I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, here I am. Okay, wedding supper, you know, fellowship, so on. Oh, I need to open the, the fifth seal. Dang, we've got martyrs now. That's a problem. Oh, well, you know, I just hope you can see how how weird this is. This is not, to me, this does not ring true as far as how God does things and the patterns that he's already established. So the wedding supper is not in Revelation until the very end, until the very last chapter. The very last chapter when the spirit and the bride invite people who are living on the new earth to come into the holy city and eat from the tree of life and drink from the water of life. That's the invitation. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That happens after the millennium. That's when Christ can truly rest. That's when the bride appears in all of her glory. That's when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God. So we have the dwelling place is all prepared for the bride. We have the bride all prepared for the groom. And we have peace where the groom is not going to be working. So these are just some issues that I have with the typical pre-tribulation rapture position.
if, if the bride isn't raptured into heaven and there's not a seven uh, year marriage supper of the Lamb, what does Revelation actually tell us about what happens immediately after we're raptured? Well, you have to understand we're raptured as heirs and sons. As God's children, as heirs of Christ, that is our identity when we're, we're raptured, as those who are going to inherit. This is all over scripture. We're, we're made children of God, we're sons of God, and we have an inheritance. That's the, the terms that the Bible uses about our future. So we're going to be... Um, brought into heaven, and that's when we will receive our glorified bodies. Okay, that's once we get to heaven, that's when we get our glorified bodies. We're not going to receive them on the way up. We'll get them once we're in heaven. It's part of um, the honor, I believe, that's going to be bestowed on us is our bodies of glory. And Paul talks about that a little bit in 1 Corinthians 15 when people were asking him about the resurrection and how is it that people appear and, you know, what kind of bodies will they have. And one of the analogies he uses is that of stars. And he talks about how there's a glory of, of the sun and the moon and there's, there's a star differs from star and glory. That the people who are... Um, righteous shine like stars. That stars are a way that the Bible talks about people who reflect or who have glory. Okay, we're, we're, it's stars. So there's going to be varying degrees of glory and different kinds of glory even among believers who are in heaven as God's stars. We'll receive our our place before God, our throne, our place, will receive uh, our crown for faithfulness and so on, and then we'll take that crown off. Okay, we'll receive our white robe, we'll receive a harp, okay, we'll receive a golden bowl, and all of these are necessary because we've got a job to do. Okay, so we'll be uh, receive our glorified bodies, then we're going to be presented to God. Jesus, uh, in uh, the scriptures, there's a, there's a prophecy about Christ in the book of Hebrews. He says, here am I and the children you have given me. Okay, this is Christ calling us his children. But when we go before God, he's, Jesus is going to say, here I am and the children you have given me. We're sons and heirs. We're presented to God. He's going to confess our name before the angels, before the Father. We're going to be given a new name, just like um, the baby boy in the eighth day is given a name. We're going to be given a new name too. It's uh, you know, it's a secret name. It's a pet name. It's a it's a name of power. That's part of our presentation to God. So that's what we see in Revelation chapter four. Both the dead in Christ who are heirs, um, kings and priests, and the believers who are raptured, presented as um, glorified children of God. After that, in Revelation chapter 5, we see these uh, elders going to work. Okay, They're working. It's a restful work, though, because they're seated. They're not standing. They're in a restful position. They're on their thrones. First, they worship it is called our reasonable service in Romans 12. Our reasonable service is to worship God. And the other thing they do is they pray and intercede. They have golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, that they are praying for the people on earth. So immediately, uh, we go to work, okay? Christ is working, we're working. There's going to be work until the kingdom gets handed to the Father at the end of the millennium, okay? There's not, um, we don't get the downtime. We get 
soul rest. We get a glorified body, no pain, no sickness, no disease, no death. But it's not like we're not working anymore. We are actually going to be stepping into the work that we've been being prepared for here, and that work will continue on into the millennium. And in fact, we see uh, that one of the 24 elders is talking to John and, and talks with him about who are these people that you see um, standing before the throne? And uh, John says, I don't know, you know. <laughs> he says, the, the elder tells him, these are those who've come out of the great tribulation. That is the 10-day persecution of believers. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so this is what I see in the book of Revelation. To me, this is scriptural. You can actually point to passages that talk about this and none of this is extremely cryptic it's not like it's really hard to understand the symbolism here when you look at the book of revelation and you're trying to find a bride or bridal imagery in the book trying to find seven years of tribulation or wrath trying to like Really, all of the stuff that most people have come up with as far as a pre-tribulation rapture position have neglected to use Revelation. They don't really use it at all except for bits and pieces of it. And they try to derive an eschatology almost exclusively from Paul's writings. And that is a very, you know, you only have a few puzzle pieces to work with if you're doing that. And then, of course, whatever you come up with is going to be flawed. Okay, and I believe the pre-tribulation rapture position as it's being taught right now is flawed. I don't believe a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe a pre-seal, pre-trumpet rapture. We're going to be gone before the seals are opened or the trumpets are blown. We're going to be in heaven at that um, when those things happen. And the main reason for that very first rapture of kings and priests and elders is because Christ wants assistance. He wants us to be there to assist him. Just like Moses had 70 elders to assist him because there's a lot of work to do. Christ is right now interceding for us before the throne of God because Satan accuses us day and night. If he leaves the place of intercession and goes and gets the scroll and starts opening the seals and working now as the judge... He is no longer acting uh, as the intercessor. So he has people that he's authorized and empowered to intercede while he's doing other things. And there's a lot of things that Jesus does during this time period of the end. He does not want to abandon the golden altar. He needs people to be there. And the angels do not intercede for people. Only someone who is a man can intercede for men on earth. Okay, Angels do not intercede. Men act as priests interceding for other men. Okay, Men and women. So the idea here is that we're working in heaven. We're working in heaven. We're uh, basically being trained. The 24 elders are with Christ in the midst of the 24 elders interceding, praying, and worshiping. He is like discipling us, doing on-the-job training. So when he leaves this group of priests, he will first dispense the Holy Spirit on the earth. He will go get the scroll of judgment, and he will begin to step into his role as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who can rule and reign. So if someone wants to know, what are we going to do once we're in heaven? Well, this is sort of how Revelation looks at it. We're, we're made sons and heirs. We're going to be uh, presented to God in heaven, receive our glorified immortal bodies from, you know, and, and we'll all differ in glory from one, one person to another. We won't all be the same. We're going to be presented to God as children He's going to formalize the adoption, uh, adopted as sons formally. We're going to be made his children. And then we're going to begin working um, as priests. Remember, Aaron was and his sons were in the doorway of the tabernacle of Moses for seven days during their time of ordination. And 
Then on the eighth day, they actually went into the temple and began serving God. And the fire came down. And it occurred to me as I was editing my other video yesterday that that same thing happens again with us. The angel uh, will take fire from the censer that's been you know, added to the prayers of the saints and he's going to throw it onto the earth. So that's a, a different kind of fire, but it's, it's clearly uh, part of the analogy or part of the pattern. That's when we be, actually begin to work as priests. Okay, ruling and reigning as kings will not happen till the millennium, and actually acting as judges will not happen until uh, after we return to the earth and our thrones are set up on earth and we begin to judge people. We're going to judge angels. Uh, we're going to judge the world according to what Paul uh, understood. And that's going to be a big part of what we do once we come back with Christ, and then we will begin to rule with him on the earth as his junior kings. He's the big king, and we are his kings underneath him. He is the king of kings. So that's basically how I see things uh, from the book of Revelation, which has all the details. It's all in there. And, you know, to me, it's really important that if you have an eschatology, uh, about end times and you've got the book of Revelation and it's devoted to end time stuff. You should be able to match up whatever timeline and imagery and stuff you have with the book of Revelation and with previous patterns that have been established in scripture. So that's all I'm trying to do here. I have uh, handouts for you. There's show notes. I'm leaving a link to my PDF Revelation in chronological order. Uh, where I've taken each chapter in Revelation and taken the events and sort of put them in chronological order. Because even within each chapter, the events are not chronological. All you have to do is look at Revelation 12, and you'll know that you have the woman fleeing, uh, then you have a war in heaven, and then you have the woman fleeing again. It's the same thing, but you know what needs to happen in a lot of these chapters is you actually have to sift through what you read in the chapters and then you can sort of place them in chronological orders how they appear in the chapter and then it's just super fun to be able to match things up okay and there are certain things that we know will happen at a certain point in time and uh, they're sort of little markers like the abomination of desolation second woe sixth trumpet all in the same day. And we know that the seventh trumpet's going to be at the end because that's what the angel told us in Revelation chapter 10. So anyway, get a copy of that. You can look at that in your leisure. If you have a question, I uh, hope you'll leave that in the comment section. If you have a, a comment, I hope you'll leave that too. If you're new to my channel, I hope you'll subscribe and share with other people. And until the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day.